Today we are going to talk about compliance issues and um, the regulatory race card. So some of the things that have been at the gate in 2015, both on the federal level and also the state level. Um, if you have any questions, please stop us as we go through. I think it's good to ask questions as we talk about the topics, um, but we'll also have some time at the end to do that. A lot of the things we're going to talk about are consumer related and I know a lot of people in the room do uh, commercial workouts or commercial lending and so at this point you might glaze over or, you know take another trip to the buffet but this is important for you to listen to for a number of reasons. One, um, I think all financial institutions have had to adjust their budget and so you might see that a lot of money is going over to your consumer folks, a lot of people are over there, um, you know, you've had a manpower shift and you might not understand why there has been this shift in budget. We'll tell you why, uh, the CFPB, and we'll go into that in a little bit more detail, but we've had some significant regulations that have come out in 2014 and 2015 and it really has challenged financial institutions in the way that they allocate their resources. So it's important for you to think about for your institution what's happening on a global scale. And so I think this will give you a little bit of insight into that. Also, I mean, most of us own homes, so some of the statutes that we'll talk about today and the changes will impact you as a homeowner or uh, if you sell your home or if you buy a home. Um, also, too, we all get that call at least once a year at the family reunion from someone saying, I know you went to law school or you work at a bank. What happens in this situation? You know, how can I sue my car dealer or whatnot? So we'll talk a little bit about that. So now you have something to say, well, I've heard about this, but you should go contact an attorney. So um, it's important on that aspect as well. And then it's just good to know what is going on uh, generally in the uh, lending landscape. I am going to talk about a lot of the changes on the federal level, in particular with the CFPB. The CFPB is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. It was created in 2010 by the uh, Dodd-Frank Act, and the CFPB really considers itself to be a cop on the beat for consumers. So it is their objective to make sure that consumers are treated fairly, that they are not confused uh, throughout the I mean, it's been the lending process, but in some ways they deal with everything. So uh, for the last couple of years, we've dealt with them not only on the regulatory side, but also the enforcement side. So the CFPB um, writes regulations for most of the federal consumer protection statutes. They issue proposed rules. We've had a number of final rules. They issue bulletins. They issue letters. They do all kinds of things. Um, they also have enforcement actions. I'm sure most of you have seen these. Uh, the National Mortgage Servicers, they've had settlements. Um, car dealers, credit reporting companies, credit card companies. Um, I think they have a suit right now against a law firm in Georgia that did foreclosure actions. I mean, the CFPB feels like they can enforce anything that affects consumers anywhere in any place, and by darn, they're going to do that. And uh, the most, the settlements that we've seen have been in the millions of dollars. It's a huge organization. They have droves of attorneys on the enforcement side, also on the regulatory side. Their budget is, I think, five times what the budget of the OCC was. And so it's a huge organization, and they have a lot of power. And so they've been busy. I uh, was joking with some of the folks earlier, I should have checked their Twitter feed this morning or their website to make sure they hadn't issued anything new last night, because you never know when things are going to come from them. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of things that we've seen from them, the proposed rules for the mortgage servicing and also the TILA RESPA integrated disclosure. First, the mortgage servicing rules. To give you a little bit of background, in January of 2014, we had new rules that took effect under the Truth in Lending Act and the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, just TILA and RESPA. And under those rules, the CFPB really put in place requirements for financial institutions and servicers regarding servicing loans, how you deal with loans that are secured by real property um, and what you do with those loans. For example, how do you deal with what we call lender-placed insurance, force-placed insurance, how do you handle escrow, um, what happens when a borrower defaults. Now the CFPB is very clear about what you need to do in those circumstances. You've got early intervention requirements, you need to reach out to them. 
say, hey, I know you can't make your mortgage payment. Let me try to help. Um, you have loss mitigation requirements that you have to follow in certain circumstances. Um, you've got to work with your borrower to try to make sure they can afford the loan. Um, the biggest issue, I think, was the 120-day rule. Th that's one that our clients struggle with, we struggle with f frequently. Um, under the, that rule, a borrower has to be 120 days delinquent before you can take the first act to foreclose under state law. Um, I think the CFPB's intent was, let's you know, if there's a problem, it gives them four months before they actually uh, face foreclosure. In our world, once a borrower gets four months behind, it is incredibly difficult for them to catch up. You know, at that point, you've got late fees. You know, you've been paying their uh, insurance and taxes, and so unless you have an aggressive loan modification program, once you're four months in, you're probably four months too late. Um, but the CFPB, in its wisdom said, you know, no, you got to give them 120 days. So for the last year, we've been struggling with some of these issues, and there are a lot of unanswered questions. The 120-day rule that I mentioned before, is it applicable to commercial loans? The CFPB never addressed that, but I mean, we all know that we sometimes have our commercial loans that could be secured by the borrower or the guarantor's residents. What do we do in that situation? It's not a consumer loan. It is consumer property. How does that work? And the CFPB really didn't uh, have any guidance that they put in writing about it. Um, what does it mean to be delinquent? That has been a reoccurring issue. How do we comply with these rules and our other obligations? For example, under the Bankruptcy Code and the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Um, loss mitigation review, how many times do you have to do it? Um, the CFPB from January of 2014 said you need to do it w at least once. Well, at that point, I've seen borrowers who have had five reviews. I think the CFPB is now like, well, we should give them another chance. I mean, how many reviews do you really have to go through before you can take that foreclosure step? And then um, how does litigation impact the loss mitigation re review under the mortgage servicing rules? We deal with a lot of uh, consumer litigation. So when you're in litigation and you have a judge telling you, I don't care what you do, I want an order in this court in two weeks saying that you can foreclose, well, it's like, I, it's really hard to tell a judge that I can't do that because the CFPB says I've got to do this. I mean, that's um, a struggle on how we uh, deal with both of those issues. So the CFPB uh, has issued a proposed rule. I don't like to talk about proposed rules. I think if you do compliance on the consumer side, you should absolutely print off the 167 pages of the proposed rule and you should highlight it and you should know about it. But you never know what the CFPB is really going to do until we get the final rule. In this instance, though, I think it's important to talk about the proposed rule because we can see where the CFPB is going, some of the issues that are on their radar, and what we should probably do while we're waiting for the final rule, and maybe it can guide us as we make these decisions. Um, the proposed rule addresses nine major topics. Comments were due March 16th of this year. Um, I've listed the nine here. I'm going to talk about a few of those. The CFPB has said, you know, they study everything they do, and they do have an entire team that just studies things. I mean, they go out, they interview consumers, they test forms. Um, here, the CFPB said that, you know, they've been in communication with members of the industry and that they've identified further issues that continue to pose implementation challenges or require clarification um, or in the CFPB believes that there are some unintended consequences or the rules are failing to achieve the CFPB's desired objectives. In looking at these proposed rules, the CFPB is not happy because they want more protections. And so when we talk about that, you'll see that they're trying to make that mortgage servicing rule that we got in January cover a number of more things. Some of the things I found interesting in this proposed rule, and again, we'll see what happens, but the CFPB has been pretty similar in what they propose and what the final rule looks like. Successors and in interest, uh, the proposed changes. A successor and in interest in most instances is, well, you know, when you're borrowing or your borrower has passed away, do you have a, a borrower spouse um, who is left with the property? Maybe there's a spouse who's not on the loan, uh, but that individual would be a successor in interest heirs if they inherited the property. Um, I've seen a lot of instances where there's a divorce, and so one spouse is going to keep the property. That spouse may be a borrowing, uh, may be a borrower. They may not be a borrower. It just depends. Um, but the CFPB has said that 
you know, they intended for the mortgage, mortgage servicing rules to cover successors and interest. Um, so that was their intent. Maybe that's not what the rule stated, but their proposed rule will require servicers and financial institutions to take those protections and apply them to successors and interest. Um, under the proposed rule, servicers uh, or banks, financial institutions will have to confirm the status of the successor and in interest. Once they receive documents confirming that the person is a successor and in interest, the uh, servicer needs to work with them and provide all the protections that they would a normal borrower. That includes um, you know, the loss mitigation requirements, the 120-day rule, uh, the notice of error and request for information, uh, that the old qualified written request, all of that a successor and in interest would be able to take advantage of. This is a challenge because in some instances, you know, what if it's not clear who gets the property or what if there's a fight about gets, who gets the property? Now is the servicer brought into that and kind of has to wait until that plays out? Um, I had a case where there wasn't a fight between new wife and um, husband's children about who was going to get the property. Wife was living in the property. No one really knew what to do. And that went on for about a year. And I think it was a pretty high dollar property. So you can imagine the amount of the default once they had figured that out. Um, according to the CFPB, you've got to give them these protections. They, they're not required to assume the loan to get the protections. So you've got to do the loss mitigation review. If they qualify for a loan modification, then they need to assume the loan and do the loan modification all at one time. And that um, is something that servicers, I think, have been doing under the Home Affordable Modification Program. There is a simultaneous assumption modification. Um, the CFPB did state that you're not guaranteed a modification because you are a successor in interest, but you at least have to be given the chance to review it or to be reviewed for a modification. And the CFPB believes that your uh, servicers should confirm the successor and in interest status pretty quickly because otherwise you know the debt is accruing on the loan and um, foreclosure can happen so all this needs to be done uh, fairly quick one thing you cannot do under the proposed rules is condition you know the loss mitigation the early intervention on assumption of the loan so you can't require um, spouse to assume the loan before you do the loan mod. She has to understand, yes, you can get the loan mod, but you need to assume all at one time. I mean, I, I will admit that the successor and in interest issues are not perfect. I have a lot of um, individuals who maybe obtained the home in a divorce through the divorce decree. They can afford the property and there's a lot of confusion about how we handle that loan, how you do a modification. It just seems that uh, giving successors and in interest the protection once you've confirmed that they are the successor and in interest and then having to go through the process is going to be difficult, lengthy, um, and you know if they don't have the income it, at some point they're not going to be able to stay in the home. Another uh, topic that the proposed rules cover is what is a delinquency. This is helpful but only just a little bit. So under the 120 day rule you have to you have to have 120 days of delinquency before you can foreclose. There's a lot of confusion over what is a delinquency. The prior rules define delinquency for a portion of the rules, so just for the early intervention and the contact uh, provisions. The CFPB has now said that delinquency definition will apply to everything. And so a mortgage loan is delinquent beginning on the date of periodic payments sufficient to cover principal interest and if applicable escrow becomes due and unpaid until such time as the payment is made. The CFPB has said, you know, you're not delinquent if you miss a late charge, that's not enough. Um, my concern is, and this is technical, but the definition if it includes an and, do you have to miss principal interest and escrow to be delinquent or should it have been an or. Um, I'm hoping that there are comments submitted on this issue because it comes up all, all the time and that the CFPB will offer a little bit more clarification. In my mind right now reading this, if the CFPB says late charges are not enough to uh, trigger a delinquency, they didn't say that about escrow, so escrow should you know, be enough to trigger a delinquency, but we'll see what the final rule says. Um, one thing that's interesting, there is a difference between a delinquency according to the CFPB and a default under your loan documents, um, and we need to understand what that relationship is. If you have a default under your loan documents and you've accelerated the loan, how does that impact these rules? So um, again, they've answered some questions, but not everything that we need. Um, 
early intervention proposed changes you just got to make contact now uh, the 36 day after each payment due date for the duration of the borrower's delinquency again this right now is just the proposed rule and extension of the rules that we have in place um, so you love it your borrowers love it when you call and call and call and the CFPB wants you to call and call and call um, there was some confusion when the mortgage servicing rules came out about how it uh, the interplay between the mortgage servicing rules and other statutes that we're obligated to comply with, like bankruptcy or the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Um, with the bankruptcy, right now there's an exception. If one of the borrowers is in bankruptcy, you don't have to do any of this. The CFPB felt like that was just that was too easy and so uh, the proposed rule will require live contact in some certain circumstances if you have a borrower who didn't file for bankruptcy but they're on the loan you need to reach out with them um, and in some circumstances you need to send a letter to the borrower that says you could qualify for loss mitigation options if they're available this part of the proposed rule was very confusing it's very complex it's a long uh, section in the proposed rule I'm hoping that the final rule will offer a little bit more clarification on this because I mean it's difficult right now to see you know where the bank the borrower is in their bankruptcy who's involved is it a 7 is it a 13 if they converted has it been dismissed and I think putting these requirements in place depending on who filed what the schedules are what the you know status of the cases is, is difficult and for people who are in court on this um, I don't want to explain to my bankruptcy judge why my client is sending letters which could be perceived as a violation of the automatic stay. So um, the CFPB recognizes the difficulty here and they've offered some proposed changes. I don't think they're ideal, but we'll see what they actually, uh, what shakes out. Another problem is the interplay between these rules and the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Uh, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, or the FDCPA, prohibits unfair, false, misleading, deceptive communications between a debt collector and a consumer. If your bank has made all your loans, you keep them, you haven't uh, purchased them from anyone, in all likelihood you can take a sigh, a big deep breath right now because you're not a debt collector under the FDCPA. You're a creditor and so you don't have to worry about it. But if you have purchased some loans that were likely in default, if you purchased a bank that had home loans that were in default, or if you have um, had a service transfer of loans to your institution that were in default, you are likely a debt collector. And we've had this happen a lot um, because I think in the climate you've got loans that are seriously in default, let's get these off our books, send them somewhere else. And, and I don't know if the the people who are purchasing these or the uh, transfer servicers uh, really understand what type of implication this brings. So under the FDCPA, if you're a debt collector, you can't do anything unfair and deceptive. And if the borrower contacts you and says, don't call me anymore, cease and desist, you have to do that. So we're running into the problem, we've got to cease and desist on the account, but we're also required by the CFPB to send this information. How do we handle that? The CFPB has a bulletin out there right now that says, you know, if you send stuff under our rules, it's not a violation of the FDCPA. There are limitations on that. It's only certain items that you send. Other items will trigger FDCPA liability or could, depending on what the letter state. Um, but the CFPB has said, we understand this inherent conflict. Um, you know, right now you're exempt, but we're going to propose that you have to reach out to borrowers who have told you not to reach out to them and provide some information. So it's a, a difficult situation. The CFPB understands, um, and so they are going to issue a final rule on that at some point. Uh, loss mitigation proposed changes. Servicers have to get a loss mitigation application in and review that within a certain time frame. Some things that you need for that are not within the borrower's control, like tax transcripts. You've got to send you know, your forms off to the IRS to get that. You have an obligation to identify that early on and get it. You can't drag your feet and say, oh, um, we're waiting for the IRS, we're waiting for the IRS. You need to do that early on. And so the CFPB has said that's something that they are um, looking at and they require you to do. So those are the uh, proposed rules under the mortgage servicing standards that we have right now. And um, again, I, I don't like to look at the proposed rules. I'd much rather look at the final rules. But I think it helps guide some of the questions and the issues that we're having right now with what we have to deal with under the RESPA TILA rules. 
Um, another big area are the combined disclosures under RESPA and TILA. And if you are in the consumer space, you've been dealing with this, you've probably been dreaming about it, and you're an expert, you should get up here and do this. Because I know that a lot of people have been living with these forms, you've been testing the forms, but there are some things I want to talk about that I think will be helpful, and maybe some things you haven't thought about with respect to this. Uh, for you commercial folks, this is important because it will impact the way you purchase a home um, or you sell your home. And, and so I think it's interesting for you to know about it and think about how this is going to impact your institution. If you hear a lot of people talking about TRID in your office, they're not talking about um, a horrible ex-boyfriend or a crazy cousin. They're talking about the TILA RESPA integrated disclosure rules. So that's a little bit of uh, consumer finance funny for you this morning, uh, that these are the TRID rules. Um, Yes, they are about disclosures, and so I'll talk about that in a few moments and what they are, but they're so much more. You've got these new disclosures that you have to provide, but you also have to figure out how you're going to do this. How are you going to train your staff when the loan is made to make sure that these disclosures are correct? How are you going to train them to make sure that they provide them in the right amount of time because there are clear deadlines to provide the information? What type of processes and procedures are you going to have in place at, when the loan closed to review these, to make sure that they're correct, to make sure your tolerances are correct? Um, and then how are you going to handle this with your investors? If you don't hold your loans and you sell them, what are your investors requiring? Um, what type of quality control review do you have? And um, what are you going to do when they're wrong? And your investor is like, I'm not taking this. You've got to take it back. I mean, how are you going to implement that? Um, the forms are also very difficult, so I'm sure you all have uh, contacted your existing vendors or new vendors to help uh, you with these forms. Um, that triggers vendor management under the CFPB. So what do your contracts say with your vendor? What are your terms? Are you making sure that your vendor complies with uh, consumer protection laws? Because the CFPB expects you to do so, and it's my understanding that that's something that they're looking at, at their, in their exams. And more importantly, too, with these rules, they were made under the Truth in Lending Act, and so they have liability associated with them. In the past, when I had a borrower tell me my HUD was wrong, I don't care. There's no liability for it. That's established law in the Sixth Circuit. I mean, you can jump up and down about that all day. There, there's no issue here. Unfortunately, we can't do that anymore. So there will be liability if the forms are not correct under TILA, um, if the, they're not given the correct time period, and if the tolerances are not correct. And it's a $4,000 violation. It's also attorney's fees. Um, that's where I think we run into the big deal is what are the attorney's fees. And these are factual issues. I mean, how am I going to prove that a borrower got a form three days or seven days? And um, so there will be litigation associated with this, and we, it will be expensive. Uh, what is, what are these disclosures? For those of you don't, who don't know, you know, when you would get a loan, you'd get sign up for the loan, you would get a good faith estimate and an early till. Um, that has all been combined into the loan estimate. When you would close the loan, um, you would get a HUD and a final till. That has all been combined into the closing disclosure. I don't see Rick Vance in the room. Well, there he is. He jokes when I say this, but um, these the existing documents, not all of them, but many of them have been around for longer than both of us have been alive. Um, and I mean, I, I heard someone say the other day that this is the biggest change in consumer lending in the last 40 years. I mean, it's an entirely new playing field with the documents that we have and the, the forms that they are. So all of this takes place August the 15th, which is why I know the consumer folks, you've been dealing with this. You've got your forms in place. You're ready to rock and roll. Um, the CFPB is still issuing little you know, rules and changes, and so it'll be interesting to see what they do. I mean, these are going to happen. The Dodd-Frank Act required the CFPB to look at these forms and create new disclosures. And... Um, it took them five years to do it, but I mean, we're rolling down this track and we're going to have these new disclosures in August. So, the loan estimate you will get three business days after you have an application. In the past, you know, what an application was kind of fuzzy. The CFPB has said no. Once you have six pieces of information, three about the consumer, three about the property, then you have an application and then you need to issue the disclosures within three days. Some people have said, and when I say some people, only the CFPB has said this, I think, that it, it levels the playing field. Now everyone knows when you have an application and you have to send out this loan estimate. 
And so whether that will be true, who knows. But once you have the six pieces of information, if you're just a borrower, you are entitled to a loan estimate, which will tell you about the key terms of your loan. The CFPB did some extensive testing on this, and they went out to consumers and wanted to know what terms were important to the consumers. So the first page has the key terms, like the loan amount, the interest rate, what your monthly principal and interest rate will be, your prepayment penalty, and your balloon payment. On the first page, there is a box that says your estimated cash to close. It shows what you have to bring closing uh, at the closing date. What, what kind of cash you have to bring at the closing. There is civil liability tied to some of these figures. If the Dodd-Frank said that they needed to be implemented and you don't get it right, then you could have TILA liability. And I do have, yeah, this is just a picture of the what the loan estimate will look like. Um, it's three pages, the sample one that the CFPB has. The APR is moved to the back. I think a lot of people who have been doing consumer finance for a number of years have found that to be very bizarre. Um, the CFPB determined that consumers didn't know what the APR was. It wasn't that important to them just to get in the back. Um, the amount financed and the finance charge are no longer disclosed on this loan estimate. Um, there's a new term, the total interest percentage. I don't know how helpful this will be for consumers, but it's the total amount of interest that you will pay over the loan term as a percentage of your loan amount. The uh, loan estimate also includes a uh, notice about the appraisal, the servicing disclosure, so saying whether your loan will be service released, um, and there is a sign, a place where you can sign to say that you've received it, which would be really helpful in the litigation. The uh, other disclosure is the closing disclosure. So this is number two of the TRID rules. And it it can be from five to six pages. The sample that the CFPB has is um, just five pages. Some interesting things about this, it it identifies mortgage insurance on a loan, but it also says you know how long it will be on the loan. So for this one, it says years one to seven, you'll have mortgage insurance. Years eight to 30, you will not. I think that's an interesting addition. It may be helpful for consumers, um, but it might be difficult to calculate. There's also what we would always consider the HUD, showing all the charges in and out of the closing. Uh, the, that's still there. All kinds of other information. Um, it, it's gonna take some consumers you know, an hour to sit down and think about all this. They have to get this closing disclosure three days before the closing. So uh, that will give them time to review it, understand what's going on. The closing disclosure has a uh, section on assumptions, whether the loan can be assumed, um, what can happen in the future. And the thing that I find most interesting, there's a section that says liability after foreclosure. So can your bank get a deficiency against you after a foreclosure? In some states, this is easy. Other states, not so much. I mean, Oregon, you, you can get it, and sometimes you can get it in you know, other cases. And so, and it really depends on the facts of the underlying loan. So, I mean, how do you disclose that if you're a servicer? Um, and especially if you are making loans across the country, you know, you have a lot of different options that you can put there. So, um, the CFPB thought all these would be helpful, but in some ways, they're just making things um, much more difficult. If the terms change, you have to redisclose. You've got to send a new disclosure to the consumer, and that has to be done within a certain period of time in some instances before the closing. Um, this is just going to be a delay. And so, you know, if you're a buyer and you're trying to get into a home, these may these disclosures may cause you problems. And I read an article the other day that you know, real estate agents don't don't know what's kind of coming down the line because they're not really impacted by this, and so that this is going to impact their business, and maybe they haven't fully appreciated it just yet. One, um, a couple more things on the trade rule that I'll go through pretty quickly. The it applies to closed-end consumer loans secured by real property. I've had a lot of people confused by how manufactured homes work. In Kentucky, uh, our manufactured homes, we all intend for them to be part of the property. Whether they actually end up that way, it's a mystery. It's case by case. But in those cases where you intend to give a mobile home, it's supposed to be part of the property, and you're doing a loan secured by the real property, these uh, disclosures would apply. The form is also dynamic uh, for those IT people out there. I think that's interesting. So now you've got to fill in every little box. So if a particular term is not applicable, it won't be on the form anywhere. And I, I'm not IT savvy, and so I think this sounds super complex and confusing, but 
Um, it's supposed to eliminate all of those empty spaces and things like that for things that are not applicable, like an adjustable interest rate if you don't have it on your loan. Um, how are we doing on time? Do you know? Okay. Um, I think... I'll skip over the TILA right to rescind because I think it's in some of the other areas and I want uh, Brian to talk about some of the important things he's got on his slides. Um, in the information I have a section about the CFPB complaint database. If you do consumer loans and you have not checked the database, you need to. Um, I have some clients, I was bored one night, I checked it for them because I'm sitting at home just searching around on the CFPB's website, which officially makes me a nerd. Um, yeah. but just for the record, that's not what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, what I'm <laughs> no. so that, um, and so you need to look at it. It's really interesting. I mean, I looked at Kentucky just to see what was out there. There's quite a few, mostly credit reporting, credit cards, and claims relating to national mortgage servicers. Uh, the database discloses the zip code, the state, the company, the company's response, and how the complaint was submitted. It also discloses the product and the issue. If you've got a particular product that you've got some concerns about, just troll around on there one day and see what uh, consumers are complaining about. If a consumer is complaining about one particular product on multiple occasions, that's probably a good sign that you've got some issues. Um, and so it's something to look at. The CFPB, I, I think, are absolutely looking at that. And uh, there's a new push that they're going to make the complaints and the details available to the public. It's a problem. They just publish the stuff up there. I mean, if you've ever dealt with a CFPB complaint, um, you know that borrowers will get on there and just say whatever they want, even if the case is involved in litigation. So I think making this information as public is a problem. Um, I can see some aggressive plaintiff's attorneys also trolling around on there and saying, oh, you know, X institutions got all these problems. I'll sue, and this will be a class action, and I'll just be busy for a year, you know. So get on there, see what's out there, um, and just take a look. As of right now, there's been about 550,000 complaints. In 2013, 37% of them were mortgage related. In 2014, only 20% were mortgage related. I don't know if that's a sign of the financial climate. Um, but it's something to think about. The new issues are debt collection complaints. So I think that's a sign of where uh, consumers are not happy, where the CFPB is going, because I fully expected that we would have revised rules under the FDCPA today and we'd be talking about it. But we don't. Um, but it's a problem. So it's something to look at. I've exceeded my time, so I'll let Brian talk for a moment. Well, as, as uh, Katie said, uh, my name is Brian Bennett, and uh, I'm, I'm two years, I think, behind Katie, and so Katie's taught, taught me everything she knows, which, as I think is evidence today, is, is quite a bit. Um, and so I, I, always, I always go to her whenever these complex questions come up. Um, but yeah, uh, thank, thank you all, first of all, for being here today. Can you all hear me fine? Because I may, I may sit back a little bit. Um, so um, what I'm going to do, Katie's kind of talked uh, on some of these specific issues that you'll um, are probably already dealing with or will be soon. Um, this is, I think, the third year in a row we've presented on some of these issues. And you know, when Katie's talking about this delinquency issue, I remember one of the audience members asked that question about whether whether taxes and insurance is covered. And I remember stumbling through my response because I was like, well, that was Katie's part of the presentation and, and she's not here today. And I'm here today <laughs> to say we still don't have a clear answer. From yeah, the and, 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 so, and so if we don't have the questions, it's, it's the C, or, or the answers to your questions, it's the CFPB's fault because they haven't given us the, the guidance yet. Um, but but no, it's, it, it, it is fun and, and Katie jokes about, um, you know, checking on Twitter and everything. But I mean, honestly, that's, that's kind of how you have to track the CFPB. I mean, it's it's a new animal. You have to you have to follow social media or follow their website, and they do have a user friendly website, and so it is helpful to go get news, to go get information. But I mean, um, that's really how we get our information, and then you know, there's a big enforcement action, and that's where they're going next. Um, I did look. Um, just at a couple of highlights, the CFPB had a panel earlier this month. Um, some of their enforcement examinations and rulemaking individuals were there. And just a few highlights that came out of that kind of on a macro level first. Um, the number, number of examiners in the Office of Supervision at the CFPB has doubled in the past year alone. And so, you know, I, I think just in terms of, again, a macro level, it kind of speaks as to you know they're they're continuing to increase their staff um, they're continuing to go into other areas 
Um, they're continuing to get into a lot of these issues. And, and, you know, hopefully what that means for us is that more individuals to help provide clarity where there isn't any clarity, perhaps. Um, but at the same time, it means that there's more people to do more work, um, which, again, I think can have positive and negative ramifications. But um, I, th I thought that was startling to me that they doubled their, their staff in the Office of Supervision in just one year alone. Um, one of the other themes that kind of came out of this panel discussion was that they, they did stress that um, in their supervision and enforcement actions that the facts matter, which obviously uh, probably does not catch you by surprise. Specifically, they mention um, in looking at unfair, deceptive uh, trade practices that, um, you know, the, the conduct that, is, that they're looking at, that they're enforcing, um, the facts matter. And the facts matter in terms of um, whether enforcement is actually appropriate, and the facts matter also in terms of what penalty is being assessed. And so what, what this means is, um, as Katie talked about, we're doing increasing amounts of compliance. And so what this means is the more you're doing to be proactive about some of these issues that we're discussing, the more lenient the CFPB may be in terms of, you know, if there's things that aren't compliant, then the more leeway they have to, to work with you in, in the result. But the, the third thing that, that I took away from this panel discussion was that remediation to consumers is non-negotiable. And so um, I, I thought that was interesting just from a macro level, kind of looking at the issues that, that they're talking about, because again, that's kind of where they're going next. Um, so. In January 2015, um, there was this consumer mortgage shopping report, and um, this was done looking at home buyers in 2013. Um, and so last year, uh, Katie and I, and, and the year before, I believe, we, we were talking about ability to repay standards, uh, qualified mortgage rules under the Truth in Lending Act. Um, these regulations became effective January 10th of last year. Um, and so there, there's been a spotlight on the mortgage industry and, um, you know, basically making consumers aware of options that are available in the marketplace for them to, you know, shop, shop the terms of their loan, shop for their loan term, shop for the loan type, shop for their interest rate. And so these, are, again, just kind of on a macro level, um, you know, I, I think the result of the regulations that we, we talked about last year is that, um, you know, lending has frozen a little bit, there's, there's less risky type of loans, there's less adjustable rate loans, um, interest only, negative amortization, um, and so we're seeing more, more vanilla loans. And so a lot of, a lot of this um, anecdotal evidence that they're looking at and the statistics they're looking at from 2013 was pre um, these regulations coming down, so I don't think it fully encapsulates some of the issues we were talking about last year. But um, as you can see, you know, almost half the consumers fail to shop around is what they're finding. Three out of four are only applying with one lender or broker. Um, most consumers are getting information from lenders or brokers who have a stake in the outcome. Um, and that informed consumers are twice as likely to shop around. I mean, I, I don't think there's anything too um, shocking about that. But again, I mean, this is what the CFPB is taking this data and then creating the rules around around that and, and, and you know hopefully also educating which I think is a beneficial thing for, for everyone um, both on the industry side and the consumer side. Um, so kind of where this January 2015 consumer uh, mortgage shopping report led to is the Know Before You Owe Mortgage Shopping Toolkit. And so that is this right here. It's uh, about 25, 26 pages. Um, has anybody seen seen this yet? Okay. Um, so currently, there's there's in place um, a HUD booklet that is supposed to be passed out to consumers at the time of their mortgage application. So this is going to be taking over, and in conjunction with some of the forms that Katie was talking about before, um, in, in the disclosures that are required or will be required as of August 2015, this uh, Know Before You Owe Mortgage Shopping Toolkit is um, designed to to, to remedy the fact that people are not shopping their loans. And so at the time that you um, are taking an application for a mortgage um, from a consumer, 
you're supposed to be providing this as of August of this year to make sure that you know they they're able to thumb through this. They're able to consider you know well should I should I go to another lending institution? Um, should I should I have a, a better interest rate? I mean I, I think at the end of the day people are looking at this you know people know I have I can get an interest rate here at three five or I can get an interest rate here at four and, um, and you know I think people are looking at that but. People aren't looking at a very detailed level. You know, I, I bought a house um, two and a half years ago, and you know, it wasn't that. You know, I, on that end of things, I was just looking at, well, what's the best interest rate? And and you know, I, I like to think of myself as educated, but I, I wasn't really shopping the market, and that was despite the fact that I'm that I'm a, a mortgage litigation attorney. <laughs> um, and so, um, if I'm not, you know, I guess I, I, I guess where the CFPB is going is trying to continue to educate consumers to make sure that they're looking at the marketplace and just seeing what their options are. Um, again, this is going to be in conjunction with the forms Katie was talking about. And so just, just be on the lookout for this. Um, and if you want to take a look at it, feel free um, afterwards. But it, what, what it has is just worksheets, checklists, research tips. Um, and, and again, I think it is educational. It's going to be helpful for consumers just to just to look at what their options are to allow them to continue to um, you know make make good financial decisions because at the end of the day, if they make a good decision, you know that's that should be good for uh, the institution as well. Um, one other area that we touched on last year was payday loans. Um, this may not affect a ton of people here in the room but uh, you know as you know um, payday loan is essentially a small short-term loan usually a high interest rate um, a lot of states have exemptions for um, for for payday loans from uh, the normal usury statutes and so um, what the payday loan uh, proposal again these were proposed rules that were handed down in March of this year um, what um, this is I mean this was in USA Today um, uh, President Obama has been talking a lot about these issues. So this this has been an issue that's been kind of talked about and will continue to be talked about as the year wades on, as the rulemaking process continues. Um, but what they're trying to avoid, um, you know, payday lenders oftentimes, you know, they, they get a bad rap, but um, oftentimes, you know, the issues that are trying to be looked at and remedied is that underwriting um, obviously doesn't have the same standards um, and the same practices that, that you all may see on the residential or commercial side. Um, you know, so that's a problem in terms of, you know, people, the ability to repay is not actually looked at a lot of times because, because the dollar figure at issue, the uh, term of the loan is very short. Um, Rollovers are very common, and so you know this is uh, a lot of times obviously individuals who who may be just making it financially, and so um, you know maybe disadvantaged and may not have the ability to get funds elsewhere, and so um, the ability to roll over loans um, is, is a big problem, um, and people end up in the cycle of debt, and so again another issue uh, or another reason why the CFPB is looking at it, um, and, and they're also looking at this because um, payday lenders typically have access to direct deposit um, and so you know if, if you're struggling to make your utility payments and you know you're not going to be able to put food on the table you know it, I think for obvious reasons um, this is this is a big focus of the CFPB you know in terms of being a consumer minded uh, entity and so um, on the next page I won't go into detail just for time but um, there is is some information about kind of what they're looking at how they're breaking it down um, again this is still in the rulemaking phase and so um, you know they're still still uh, taking comments um, it hasn't even got to a pu public comment stage um, but they're looking at short-term loans being um, payback within 45 days uh, longer term loan is 45 days or greater um, and, and the two goals, either under a short-term loan or a long-term loan, is uh, prevention on, on the front end um, to make sure that people aren't falling into these issues, and then uh, protection on the back end after people are already uh, consumers of, of payday lenders, um, you know, making sure that on a prospective basis after these rules take place, that, that people are able to um, actually repay their loans. And again, this, this would bring payday lenders basically in conformity with the mortgage lending um, discussion that we had over the past two years. And so, um, you know, I think, I think it, 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 I guess, levels the playing field in that sense. And again, it's um, a vulnerable, pop, vulnerable population a lot of times. And so, 
um, you know, expect more coming down shortly on that. And this is super, super, super scary um, because the proposed rules could apply to car loans, deposit advance products. Um, I, my family has a buy here, pay here car lot. They think payday lenders are the scum of the earth. Um, imagine that. But I mean, it could hit both of them: payday lenders and you know, auto dealers. You know, buy here, pay here car lots. And th I should print this proposed rule out and start highlighting and flagging things because this is a, a complete you know, change for them. They're not used to this and so uh, this will be a big deal. We'll talk about this at the 2016 regulatory race card, I'm almost positive. Yeah, for, for to keep us on track since we're first up, um, I may I may speed through some areas. I was hoping Katie would talk the whole hour so then I could just go go have a bourbon or something. <laughs> uh, um, so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and skip over. Um, you know, we look at a lot of these federal issues that are coming down and obviously they're very important. Um, but I also wanted to cover just briefly a couple of legislative enactments. Um, this is only going to be for Kentucky folks um, in the room. Uh, we were looking at 2015 General Assembly activity, and there's a pretty, pretty photo of the Capitol with some tulips, I guess. First of all, um, House Bill 201, um, this is um, basically the continuation of a bill from last year. So. Um, it provides that real estate mortgages continue to secure all interest rate modifications. Last year there was a change, a legislative enactment that covered only interest rate reductions. Um, this is essentially a clarification bill uh, just to make sure that it's clear. I mean, this was uh, pushed for by the Kentucky Bankers Association um, just to clarify that, that any interest rate uh, modification, whether an interest rate reduction or an increase of the interest rate is covered, continues to be covered by the real estate mortgage. And so it's um, a technical change, but, but you know, I think important um, to clarify that and make sure that your mortgage is still um, securing the debt, um, you know, whether there's modifications later down the line or not. Um, Senate Bill 78, um, this is affecting auto lenders. Um, I can go through this one quickly. I do have a photo of my car up there. Um, so if anyone wants to ride back to Louisville with me later. Um, this, um, in terms of the, the effect of it is, is really the, the bolded part up there. Um, storing uh, or individuals or companies who store and tow motor vehicles have, have a possessory lane, have always had a possessory lane. Um, or at least under existing law, have had a possessory lane under the vehicle. This clarifies that they also have a possessory lane over the contents. There are specific exemptions um, that are there. Um, and, and where this comes in for uh, anyone who does auto lending is that there's also an addition um, that, that protects, it's, it's a good thing for, for auto lenders, it protects and um, provides notice, additional notice to lenders to the extent that um, the individual whose car has been towed or stored has not paid off their lien within 45 days. The lender has provided notice within uh, first 15 days of impoundment and then has the ability to come in and uh, pay off the towing and storage company. Um, we've actually, we, we've dealt with this issue uh, before this before this enactment and it was kind of the wild wild west in the case that I was working with and so it's kind of good to have some clarity for anyone who does auto lending and make sure that you know you don't have uh, a car being sold out from underneath you impairing your lien rights. Um, that, that's also as with the last bill effective uh, June of this year. Uh, Senate Bill 148. Um, the, the main change there is that um, and, and this may not be a practical change. Um, I think this tends to be common practice from what I understand from most of our clients. Um, but it, it changes that um, le legal descriptions in mortgages shall include the source of title. And so what this basically means is that um, you need to have a reference to the book and page number of the deed um, in the mortgage and not just and not just the deed that's being recorded uh, for public record. And so this is uh, basically to help with chain of title issues so you can go back and forward in the chain of title and help um, you know, see where the person who has given a mortgage interest away, um, where they derive their title from. And so it's, it's, again, probably not a huge departure from what's already being done. Um, there's a question. 
Yeah, I, I should have clarified that. I, my, my desire to rush through <laughs> to keep you all on track, and I kind of breezed past that part. So, um, so these were in the legislative session for for this year um, in the spring. Um, these have already been signed in the law. The ones I've talked about thus far. Um, I do have the effective dates on, on these. So there's an effective date that's set by the attorney general opinion. Um, each year and so all these that I've discussed thus far will be effective June of this year and so um, yeah sorry I didn't touch on that thank you for asking that and clarifying um, there will be actually the, the very next one that I was going to talk about um, Senate Bill 204 um, that does have an effective date of January 1 2016 um, what that is is uh, just Kentucky's adoption of the Uniform Voidable Transactions Act. And so basically, um, you know, think of someone who is trying to manipulate or um, conceal assets. It basically brings Kentucky in conformity with um, 40 plus other states. Um, we're one of the last states who, who has some form of the Uniform Voidable Transactions Act. Um, the Uniform Fraudulent Transfers Act was uh, adopted in 1918. There's a lot of states um, who have who have that version it's an uh, older outdated version of the fraudulent transfers act and um the new law basically it just brings brings in um to conformity with uh federal bankruptcy law um other states who have already adopted these laws as well as um just modernizing to to you know consider new technologies and things of that nature. So House Bill 470 was not passed. It was actually formally withdrawn uh, in February of this year. Um, as I understand it, due to strong opposition from um, consumers and consumer advocacy groups, um, Kentucky is a judicial foreclosure state. And so what that means for us is, you know, after you take into consideration what Katie's talking about and uh, the CFPB rules, 120 days delinquency, you know, the bank contacts, probably not us usually, um, but maybe a, a colleague firm that we work with, um, and they, they file a foreclosure complaint. That foreclosure complaint is like any other lawsuit, allows the borrower then to have 20 days to respond, to raise any affirmative claims that they have against the institution. Um, and, you know, a lot of times when we come in is when it becomes contested litigation. And so we have cases that, you know, we have cases, some dating back to 2009, that are still <laughs> active. And, the, and this is the consumer, but the foreclosure process is the same for commercial and consumer loans in Kentucky. You've got to go to court. You've got to file an action. Um, whereas I know some of our uh, folks down in uh, Tennessee and Georgia can take advantage of the non-judicial foreclosure component where you just send out notice um, and then you I always love it that you say you cry the sale or I, I know I probably screwed that up because we don't do it but uh, we can't do that here unfortunately and the KBA tried um, but it didn't work out very well yeah and um, on some of the last slides it kind of lays out kind of the, the positions um, I, I mean I, th I think there's definitely some some benefits to the process and um, you know there's experts in the room people who are already going through this I know a lot of our Georgia attorneys uh, deal with non-judicial foreclosures daily um, and so um, I think I think it's interesting right now it's more of a policy discussion um, some of the benefits um, that are being laid out by KBA among others is is you know it not not all cases um, you know there's a lot of a lot, a lot of costs that go along with the judicial foreclosure process and so um, a lot of times those costs can be passed on to consumers and so there's some efficiencies in doing uh, non-judicial foreclosure and um, the law there's some dis debate about this in terms of how the law is drafted which will probably be revisited next year but um, it does allow the non-judicial proposed bill allows for consumers to request a judicial process um, in terms of how that's drafted, how that's worded, I mean, I think I think there's some dispute as to whether the lender actually has to follow through with that. Um, as I read it, I don't see any trouble with it, but obviously that, the language may be tweaked next year to find some common ground. Um, but I think it'll be interesting to see where this goes because a lot of what we do um, is is helping out with contested uh, mortgage litigation cases and so you know it's all judicial process overseen by the court and the circuit court yes ma'am i just had a question if you make a commercial loan and the borrower puts up their home for collateral you have a mortgage on it 
What laws apply to that? Do the consumer laws apply to the mortgage itself? It's, um, it really depends on the statute. Most of the consumer financial protection statutes apply only to loans that are made for personal household consumer purposes. There's some key language. Um, th this question comes up once every three or four months. And so different jurisdictions have different case law on it. Um, most of them are for that purpose. But the concern comes in um, on these 120 day rules, for example, is, you know, if it is a consumer loan, the loan was made for commercial purposes, how does the, all of that interact? And so, um, you know, the CFPB comes out to some of the conferences we attend in droves. I've tried to get them, you know, to nail down their position on that, and they haven't been so uh, helpful.